a country music journalist who's interviewed every legend you could possibly imagine on the Music Universe podcast. Hey, buddy. How are you? I'm good, bro. How are you? Oh, I am grand. Oh, my. I am grand. Uh, you know, it's warm out. It's beautiful. When we're done here, I'm going to be going outside in a little bit. Uh, have you been out? Have you taken the dogs for a walk? Uh, not lately, uh, but we do. My daughter and I tend to go outside every day and either play catch or frisbee, get a little exercise in. Um, if we're in the backyard with the dogs for the ball, I've got to throw the ball to the dogs as well. Uh, they've got their own. And then if we're out front for the frisbee, you know, we just got to dodge traffic. So we have a lot to talk about today. We sure do, because it looks like... The concert industry is slowly, slowly, slowly starting to come back. It is, yes. Tell me a little bit about this Colin Ray concert. Looks like it's going to kind of be a, a, a festival for the businesses who were really, really hurt by the pandemic and a concert by Colin Ray. Yeah, you know, Colin Ray is going to be one of the first, uh, if not the first, artists to uh, actually perform in front of uh people <laughs> that are not sitting in their cars or, you know, being held back. Um, he's going to be traveling to Kaysville, Utah for a free public event uh, following the Safer at Home orders. Um, it's going to be one of the first live concerts held in the United States since the pandemic. But, um, you know, the outdoor event is going to have booths for local non-essential businesses and uh, give company owners an opportunity to interact with the public. But, um, you know, they're, the attendees, again, it's free. They're asked to stay at least seven feet apart. Protective masks are recommended but not required, and uh, you'll have to bring your own. I just saw before we started chatting here that it's still going to violate the state's order of gatherings of 50 or more. So um, I guess we'll see. But this is supposed to be on May 30th um, in Kaysville, Utah. Well, May 30th was also supposed to be a Kenny Chesney show in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And now that's been postponed. You posted just a couple days ago on the site that it was going to happen. And then no. Right. So we'll see. We'll see. I, but I am actually, and I'm by no means an anarchist, but I'm glad to see that the industry is trying to work against some of these orders. Because as you saw, Wisconsin has now the Supreme Court denied the governor's extension of the stay-at-home orders. And if this gets up to the Supreme Court, I was telling a friend this today, it could get, you know, it could set a precedent if the Supreme Court, now the Supreme Court now I think is split pretty down the middle or pretty, excuse, pretty conservative. So I don't know that they would do this, but if they said that the governors had the power to make stay-at-home orders based on medical guidance, et cetera, et cetera, and just giving them the power to keep people in their homes, that sets a very scary precedent. Yes. So we have to watch the legal side of it, but I'm glad to see that industry is starting to push back. For me personally, I'm going to watch it a little bit more. I'm not, you know, ch I'm chomping at the bit to go. And if I travel, it would be to do things to see people one-on-one. -on -one. Like I have business with people in Nashville and Texas, friends that I want to see, very small groups. I don't know that I'd be going to a concert just yet, but I'm glad to see that the industry is pushing back. You know, that brings me to the, the next point. Um, I sent you uh, an article earlier and I said, mm -hmm. read it, but we're not going to discuss it till we're on the podcast. So the Texas Rangers are uh, hosting um, a concert in your car that uh, Quick Trip and Energy Transfer are, you know, sponsoring. The... Uh, Outdoor drive-up concert is going to have uh, several uh, Texas regional artists, you know, like the Eli Young Band, which are pretty big now, uh, Whiskey Myers, Pat Green, Josh Abbott Band, and uh, Kevin Fowler in early June for four days. So fans are going to pay $40 per car, and they're going to pull up into the parking lot of Globe Life Field in Arlington. And they're going to be able to watch a concert that's going to be on big screens. And then the audio will be available through specifically designated FM radio channels. Now, the concerts are going to um, 
also offer VIP packages with guaranteed access in the first two rows of the parking lot and are going to be 80 bucks a piece. You're able to bring your own food and your own drinks. Question that I would have, are restrooms readily available? But the bigger question, I guess, too, would you attend something like that? Eh. You can't in a city. You can't in a real city. Mm-hmm. And I and it could be a way to go for the Allentown Fair here in Pennsylvania where I'm waiting out the pandemic. But you can't do that in a place like New York City. Um, I, I got to tell you, I've never been a big fan of getting sh- smushed in a in a in a mob in a in a mosh yeah, I'm with I've you. never been a fan of that and if that goes away and people have the room to dance and whatever else and if that means lesser capacity fine I mean there's there's an energy to a packed room certainly but you can have a packed room with respecting people's personal space of course I don't know that a car, that going back to a drive-in model like we're you know like it's the 50s and it's the car hop going to a movie Nothing wrong with that, just not how I'd want to enjoy my concert, because when we go see Garth, we are sitting right now, unless we're able to get press for it, right now we are sitting very high up, Mm -hmm. and I'm hoping we're on the side of the stage where you can actually see the Vegas Strip, if the concert happens, where you can see the Strip. We're sitting very, very high up. Right. Well, I, personally... I'm looking forward to that because not only will I get to see Garth and and Garth on the Jumbotron and little tiny size of an ant Garth on the stage, but I'll get to watch the people. I'll get to watch the people. We will get to watch the people. We'll get to watch the skyline. We'll get to be a part of this something of this against the backdrop of my favorite city in the country. No offense to New York, but I love Las Vegas. I love the desert. And so I'm I I like the people watching aspect of that. You can't do that in your car, right? No, because that's creepy, right? <laughs> and I don't think I want to be sitting in my car for a couple hours either, not knowing, you know, circumstances. Can I get out? Can are they gonna? You know, they're sitting in a parking lot, and I personally don't want to pay forty bucks to watch it on a screen and listen to it through my car stereo. That's just me. But you know, and, then you're not even in the room. You're not exactly, even in the room. and and you're, you there's no merch. It's all contactless, everything. So you pull up, uh, and there you go. You're you're set. Plus, I mean, the parking lot's going to open an hour before the show. That's if if it's a big turnout, it it's going to be chaotic getting in there. You're bound to miss some unless they tell you what radio station to tune into early, and you you clock. You know you tune that in but then who's to say people sitting in the car aren't going to share that given it's a decent signal to people in the area that you know could tune in as well but i I guess if garth were to do the concert in your car aspect of it for vegas would you still go well you can't in a stadium you can't do it uh no if he's if he's in the stadium and they stream it on the jumbotrons outside the stadium in the parking lots and tell you, here's a radio station, tune in there, you can watch Garth, would you still go? No. Exactly. No, you're not in the room. Exactly. You're not in the room. I I will social distance. I will give up my ticket to a first show if he adds a second show and they divide it in half Mm -hmm. so that one person can come on one night and another person can come on the other. And if I get a guarantee that I'm switched over to that second night, which would probably be the Friday since it's Saturday. Right. I would do that because frankly, I play a I play a gambling app. Max hates it. It's fake gambling. Yeah, I don't spend any money on it. And I'm at the point where I could actually I've actually earned a two night stay at one of the hotels. Huh. So I'm gonna I'm actually gonna go a little early, check into that hotel, check out, then go over to the hotel you and I are staying at for the concert. I would I'm planned to have a vacation in Las Vegas that week, a vacation. I'll be close to a year at my current job. It'll be, I'll be set to be able to take that time. So I'm going and I'll be available to do that. I understand people have made travel plans, but that's what I see happening is them splitting it into two nights and having half go and the other half go the next night so that you're, you're every other seat. I, 
I disagree. I, I think I, I hate to always be the negative one. I guess me more real being more realistic in the way I, I think about it. I, I don't I think it's gonna be canceled or postponed till next year when when everybody mm-hmm. can gather safely and they don't have to split Here it up. Here we are going round and round again about Vegas as the litmus, but they are starting. They to are starting to reopen, parts. yes, and that is fantastic. But you have to think too. I I also heard something on local news where it's going to be four to six weeks after things start to open to see what kind of curve we've got. Well, why are we talking about all of this today? It's because we've talked to somebody who has watched country music and watched it evolve and is seeing what is happening to this industry and is seeing what is happening uh, to the artists, and that is Roxanne Atwood. And if the last name Atwood sounds familiar, Tim Atwood was the very first pandemic guest yes. that we had when we started uh, doing a bunch of interviews when I got home to Pennsylvania, she hopped on the line afterwards. I said, so what have you done? She goes, I was the producer for the Grand Ole Opry for the tele- on the television side for many years, and I'm a music journalist. And I said, we're interviewing you. Yeah. And she was like, okay, set it up through our publicist because that's how we got Tim. So, yeah. Yeah, she is. She was lovely to talk to. I could talk to her for hours more. And in fact, I'm going to accost her when we go down to Nashville. And be like, please, <laughs> let me take you to lunch and bend your ear. You know, I I felt like between the three of us sitting there chatting, I I felt like we had been friends, and we mm-hmm. had known her for so long. She was so down to earth, so cool, and gave us a lot of insight that you're going to hear ab- about how this industry had worked. It's changed quite mm-hmm. a bit since then, but just some of the stories she tells are just fantastic. So sit back, have about 35 minutes, and just enjoy what she has to say. Roxanne Atwood, welcome to the Music Universe podcast. How are you doing today? Hey, guys. I am doing fabulous. It's uh, kind of a dreary day here in Nashville, but my spirits are good, and they, they've been good throughout this social distancing pandemic that we're all experiencing you know we're hanging in there yeah and you think uh the days of uh autograph sessions and we were talking offline for a minute that uh, the days of autograph sessions and close fan pictures they might be behind us or it might take a little while to come back yeah i think that this this new normal that we're mm-hmm. experiencing mm-hmm. right now is going to be with us for quite a while i think that when you think of Lori Morgan or Jason Aldean when they're posing for with their fans in an autograph line, uh, those those days of the pictures may be gone for sure. Um, that close contact, those artists, Lori Morgan getting cheek to cheek, you know, with some of her fans. I think those days are are gone. I'm not sure what the the new normal will end up being, but I think it's going to be different, and we're just all going to have to adjust. Yeah, because I know sometimes, uh, for for one, artists love you know being able to connect like that. But some of that uh, too is uh, part of uh, you know concert packages, and I think that's going to change drastically too, at least for a while. Yeah, right now we're just wondering. We're not even wondering about the autograph lines. We're wondering what is a concert going to look like now? Mm-hmm. How are people going to be seated in those theaters? How is it going to work if they're six feet apart, but the row in front of you and behind you is only two feet, you know, different. Um, so that's going to be something. And then the, the big festivals where you have thousands of people uh, standing out in the middle of a field or a pasture or a fairground, what is that going to look like? So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I wish that I could be a genie and just blink my eyes and make it, all like it was yesterday because I mean, yesterday was pretty good. <laughs> we were having <laughs> some good times. And uh, I, I think that those times are going to come back, but just in a different way. And I just don't know what that's going to be, but I do know that the music industry will never die. There's always going to be people wanting to hear new music. And I know as far as my husband, my husband's Tim Atwood and he's an entertainer and we've been doing a lot of social media and, you know, live streams and, and uh, people are starting to, you know, follow that. Tim did a, a live feed the other day with T. Graham Brown and 
Wade Hayes, Tim Rush Lowe, Brian White, uh, and over 300,000 people wow. have viewed that oh, wow. so far. So that tells me that people are hungry for country music and they're hungry for those live performances. But, you know, that's great. And I'm enjoying that myself, but it's nothing like being at a live concert. Yeah. The, the, the last one I was at was uh, Blake Shelton and um, had, you know, I have tickets for Luke Combs coming up in October. And it's like, I, I just can't, I love the going, you know, that experience is great. And then, you know, yeah, you're crammed in there and you have to excuse yourself to get out of the, the rows, but there's nothing quite like attending a concert, you know, especially if it's sold out. Absolutely. It's that energy. I mean, some of that energy, you could just cut it with a knife. It's so cool. And, <laughs> uh, and, and I like that the music's a little too loud for my ears. And I like that people are hopping up in front of me. <laughs> I'm okay with that. It's part of the fun and it's part of the experience and and I miss that and uh, hopefully we'll be back to some form of that soon. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't know when, but hopefully in the very near future. But until then, we can listen to cool shows like your show. Right on. Oh well, thank you, thank you. You said you and uh, Tim that you guys are in the studio. How are you doing that now? Is there is it different? Or are you guys just doing it as normal? Is it relaxed enough where you are? I have to tell you, it's relaxed enough where we are. Really? First day, we went in with masks, and mm -hmm. that lasted just a very short time. Uh, we, <laughs> we, you know, we, we pray that we're being careful. Um, we're going in today. It's a matter of just uh, cutting vocals. The tracks are already laid down. So it's just Tim and an engineer and myself. And we know the engineer. We're working with a guy named Greg Cole, who produced Daryl Singletary. Um, and he's doing the Daily and Vincent show. If you guys ever watched their television show, he's the engineer for that. And so we know, Greg, the problem is you start to relax just like we're relaxing. And the problem is what they say on television, you don't know who Greg's been around. And Greg right. doesn't know mm -hmm. everybody we've been around. So it's a lot of trust. And but, but as far as truthfully, it's very relaxed and it feels like old times. And it feels good that it feels like old times. Yeah, because uh, I was just to say, because a lot of people have been laying down tracks during this quarantine and they've been doing it remotely. That's got to be much more difficult. But I know some people that's comfortable with, but with you and Tim, it's just probably easier and, and more comfortable just to be in person. Absolutely, it is. I mean, we're old school that way, but not only that, but, you know, Greg's got these fabulous microphones and this is all he does for a living. Tim, you know, Greg wouldn't get behind a piano. We're not going to get mm -hmm. behind that, you mm -hmm. know, work with the audio. That's his forte, and we trust that. And, I, I, you know, unless you're, uh, I don't know, for, for us, this works. That's all, all I'm going to say there, and it, and it feels good. And we laid down our tracks, I guess it was maybe the first week in March, um, we finished the tracks. And that was when, you know, there was all their talk that the the world had not shut down officially at that point, but we were all very cautious and careful even first week in March. Now, that was a group of people, just like the old days, you know, where we had our steel player there and the fiddle player. We had Steve Henson on steel, who is a world-renowned steel player and has been nominated, I think, multiple times for CMA and ACM Steel Man of the Year and Joe Spivey, who plays with the Time Jumpers, and these are all experienced cats, just like Tim, and it's it's a lot of fun. And I think that the music reflects that when you get a group of talented individuals in the same room together, creating something. I hope we don't lose that. I hope we can get together again in the same room like that and to continue to create. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing you created for many, many years behind the scenes, worked on it, was the television version of the Grand Ole Opry. And before I let you talk about this, I have to tell you why my, I'm just swelling up thinking about this is because every time, every night that I would stay over in the summer at my uh, grandparents' house, my grandfather, he had his little room in the, he had his little back room with the TV set up and 
uh, Grand Ole Opry was appointment viewing, I think, at that time on CMT. So before we get into your history, what do you make of how they're doing it now with the circle all access and the no, uh, the no audience? What do you look at that and think? You know, I think that Opry management is doing mm-hmm. a great job with that old tradition. The circle will be unbroken. Mm-hmm. And even though there's no audience there and they're doing that out of safety precautions for everyone, um, they're going to, they want to show, I feel like they want to show um, the public that the music will never die, that we're going to be here in one form of another, even if it's three men with guitars doing an acoustic set on the Grand Ole Opry stage. Although we're not mentioning that those, men are like Ricky Skaggs and Garth Brooks and Vince Gill. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's still quite a show. And there's, even in that big room, there's such a warmth to that on stage. I've really enjoyed it. And I think Bobby Bones is doing a great job as announcer. Um, I admire and uh, commend the Grand Ole Opry for doing what they're doing. And I think it's kind of great that they're doing it that way. I mean, I go back, though, to those old days. When I started working with the Grand Ole Opry, it was the 1980s. And um, when I started doing, working for TNN and Opry Backstage and Opry Live, which were the shows that I produced for, you know, Porter Wagner was still there and little Jimmy Dickens. And, Mm. you know, we had Bill Monroe. I can remember, have so many great stories, going out to Bean Blossom, Indiana for his Bluegrass Festival or... Uh, the very first story that they sent me on, I'm 23 years old, and they send me out to interview Minnie Pearl, who is a country oh music goodness. comedian. That was my first story. That was my morning story. I can remember that the Ryman Auditorium had given her a pew from the Ryman to go in her then museum. And I couldn't believe I was out there talking to Minnie Pearl. And then that afternoon, they sent me to Jack Green's house, and I'm out on his farm out from... Uh, Goodlettsville, Tennessee, and he's showing me around his garden, and he's taking me and showing me in his closet and all his clothes, and and um, all those people throughout the years became more than artists to me. They became friends, and I loved the Grand Ole Opry. I loved going to the Grand Ole Opry on a Saturday night. I never took for granted going through the entrance artist, entrance of the Grand Ole Opry. Mm -hmm. That was just crazy to me. And I truly thanked God every time I went through that door. But the minute you got back there back then, it was chaos. Today, it's more, it's a lot quieter than it used to be. And I think people are on the go so much with their schedules. Even though they're close, it's not like the camaraderie that it used to be. I mean, Jeannie Pruitt would be back there and she'd be sharing a recipe for vegetable soup and Hank Lachlan would be back there talking about his kids and the football games and uh, Jimmy C. Newman and Johnny Russell. And and then you mix that in with these new kids. And the new kids back in the 80s were uh, Garth Brooks. I mean, he hit in 1989, that whole class of 1989. Clint Black used to come to the Opry a lot. And, and uh, it was just so cool. And... Uh, I just never forgot that. So it was more like a hangout back then. It was. Every door backstage was open to all those dressing rooms. Mm -hmm. There were no closed Mm -hmm. doors. You could wander in and out. Or if Gene Shepard was sitting back there, or Lori Morgan, or or even Dolly sometimes, or what are you doing in the hallway? Come on in. It was just so much fun. And, uh, and you knew not only what was going on in the life of the artist, but like I said, you knew about their kids and their grandkids and their animals and, uh, you know, a little dog was at home. It was, it was a family. It, was a, it could be a dysfunctional family at mm-hmm. times. Sure. They could talk about the other, but don't you talk about them. Right. They would, you know, because they would jump you if you talked about somebody else. But it was just so cool. And, uh, I, you know, I have a lot of great memories. Interviewing George Jones for the first time was amazing oh wow and the fact that uh my last interview with george was done at his home um barefoot because when you walked into george's house nancy had white carpeting 
so you had to take your shoes off. So everybody was running around barefoot in George's house and talking about the evolution of country music, and he didn't think much of that. (laughs) (laughs) I bet. What what was it like knowing that you were going to his house, and then when you got in there, like, what was the energy, the atmosphere like for you? It was just down home. I think that uh, Nancy had a pot of beans on the stove that day when we went over, so she fed me and the crew. And the most surreal thing that I'll share with you is that Nancy and George at that time, I can't remember her name, but there was a 13 year old little girl that they had heard and her mom, their mom and dad, her mom and dad had sent a CD over and Nancy wanted me to hear this little girl sing. Well, the only CD player was in their master bathroom. So she said, Roxanne, (laughs) come on in here to the master bathroom. So she puts the CD on the, you know, in the Bose system and she goes, here, sit down. Well, the only place to sit was the toilet. <laughs> so I'm sitting on the toilet. She's on the edge of the tub. And George comes in, and he props himself up on the other end of the bathtub. And I'm thinking to myself, when I woke up this morning, I never imagined being in the bathroom with George Jones, sitting on his yeah. toilet, listening to music. <laughs> so crazy things happen like that all the time. And you really didn't think anything of it. Isn't that cool? (laughs) That is a wonderful story. Things like that happened all the time. Yeah, well, it's funny. Yeah, you said you were talking to George about the evolution of country music, and he didn't think too much of it. I wonder, I want to know your opinion on the evolution of country music, because like us, like the two of us sitting here talking to you, you've covered it as a journalist. You saw it firsthand at the Opry throughout the the 80s and the 90s, and you saw it change. What's your opinion? What do you see happening, and and is it good or bad? And how does it compare to then? Okay, well, my opinion. Personally, I don't like every song that's out on the radio now, but that's just Mm -hmm. my preference. But I believe the music has to evolve. It has to evolve to survive. And if you think back, way back, there was a time period on the Opry when you, the drums were not allowed on the Grand Ole Opry. And Mm -hmm. then there was a time period when they they let drums, I want to say Tex Ritter might have been the first one to actually pull that off, but the drums were behind the curtain. Nobody saw the drummer. And then there was a time period, a little, a few, uh, maybe a decade or so later, when Jeannie Seeley and Jeannie C. Riley would hop up on that Opry stage and they'd be in their miniskirts and their go-go boots. Well, my goodness, that was a sin, you know? So fashion began mm-hmm. to evolve for the times. And um, uh, you have to evolve it, it, or you're going to die. And yet the traditional country music will all be always be there. Um, Roy Clark told me one time that, if I can say this right, you have to picture country music as this big tree and Mm -hmm. traditional country music is the trunk of the tree and all the branches coming off of this tree are your different kinds of music be that bro country country rap contemporary country whatever we can label it it all comes from this trunk of the tree you can cut a branch of the tree off and the tree will survive but if you cut that tree from the trunk the entire tree will die. Wow. Yeah. So in his opinion, I've always remembered that, that all of this music we're listening to today comes from the trunk of that tree. And so long as we nurture the trunk, we can have all kind of branches on that tree and somebody's going to like this branch and somebody's going to like that branch, but it all stems from the same trunk. So I, I never forgot that. I thought that was a real cool analogy. That's true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So how did you get the job at the Opry starting to do country music journalism, starting to work in media? Take us way back to the beginning. How did that incredible job come to you? Well, I always listened to country music growing up. So I had a vast knowledge of country music. Um, I didn't know there was any other kind of music because back then, Kids weren't allowed to change the radio station. You know, it was up to the parents. <laughs> My parents listened to country. Uh, and so I really, truly loved it. And I ended up getting a job at the local radio station there when I was oh, 16 or 17 years old. My mother allowed me to take this job. I was a disc jockey. 
at uh, WFPR Radio from 9 Mm. p.m. until midnight, five nights a week, which is crazy. I mean, a 16-year-old going to the radio station and and doing this shift, but um, she would wait up for me. I'd get home about 12.30 at night, and then I'd get up and go to school the next morning. And then I got a scholarship to TCU, and my scholarship was in radio, um, television, film, and TCU's in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, Mm -hmm. I got a job there at a commercial radio station. I had a full academic scholarship, but I needed money to spend. And so I worked as a disc jockey there, and I was just so blessed because I got in with the right people. There was a radio station, WBAP, there, and a disc jockey named Bill Mack, who's really a legend in country music. And he took me under his wing, um, and I got to meet, you know, here I am. I was considered the kid, the prodigy. Mm -hmm. Lots of things were going on around me, but I couldn't participate in any of it. (laughs) I was just (laughs) there. And I I got to see and learn, like I went to, like, Wynn Stewart's last birthday party, and there was this, you know, man that had kind of hit out in Texas named Gene Watson back then, and We used to go and hang out with Willie Nelson when Willie was in town. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just really appreciated that. And and from there, when I graduated um, college, I went to work at a television station anchoring news, uh, Mm -hmm. continued to work in radio, got married, moved to Nashville. All I wanted to be at that point was a tour guide. Uh, and I went to okay. apply to, for the tour guide position because I was tired of work. My brain hurt. I was ready to just relax. Applied for this tour guide position, which was through Opryland. And they said, you, you know, we're not going to hire you as a tour guide. You've got too much experience, and you're going you're gonna to mm-hmm. leave us. But I promise you I want this to know. There's a television show called Wrap Around Nashville. It airs on TNN. This was 1984. Um, we want you to go and do an interview for the show. We've closed the interviews, but we're going to open it back up for you because of your experience. And I went in and I got the job, and I stayed at TNN for years and just really loved it. And like I said, it became a family to me. And, you know, I look back and I think, wow, I can remember interviewing Garth Brooks. I think it was like 2001. And Johnny Russell had just died, a member of the Grand Ole Opry. And Johnny Russell was the Grand Ole Opry artist who inducted Garth as a member of the Grand Ole Opry. And he was in town for the funeral. And while he was in town, word got out. And I think every media outlet and their brother had contacted Garth while he was in town wanting to do interviews. I contacted Garth, and I said, Garth, if you have a moment, um, I'd love to do an interview with you. I don't want to talk about your CDs or any new projects. I just want you to talk about Johnny. I was the only interview he did when he got into town. And he told he personally told me the reason I got the interview is because I was the only one who didn't want to talk business. I wanted, he, I wanted him to talk about his friend, period. And Garth sat down with me for an hour, uh, you know, on that uh-huh. day and uh, – I look back at Johnny Paycheck. Do you guys remember Paycheck? Yeah, take this job and shove it. Yeah, Johnny Paycheck. um, I was there the night he became a member of the Grand Ole Opry, and I had done um, a series of interviews with him. But one of the things I remember most about that time period is he sat down with me, and he talked about the night that he shot that man. Uh, Claimed it was in self-defense, but Johnny back then was on drugs and you name it, pills, alcohol. Um, He was pretty messed up, and he found himself in jail for two years, and he talked about hearing those bars close, you know, the clank of the the bars as they close as they, he said goodbye to the real world for two years and how that changed his life and how he turned it around that very day with that sound. And so I look back at some of the people I've talked to and, and uh, I, I always look for something. Since they were my friends and they felt comfortable, Peter Davis was a big part of the Grand Ole Opry way back when. She had a song called uh, End of the World. And I can remember interviewing her while she was having her chemo treatment. She died of cancer. Oh, 
uh, we took a camera uh-huh. in and we interviewed her while she was having chemo treatment. Um, for Memorial Day one year, I went over to Jan Howard's house. She had lost a son in mm. Vietnam, and then we decided to take the cameras over to uh, her son's graveside um, there at the National Cemetery in Nashville and how she broke down that day. So these were people who were friends of mine who I dearly loved who were sharing very intimate details with me and with us, the Nashville Network, because they knew we would protect them and we would tell their stories the right way. I never, ever, ever resulted in negativity. I never wanted to show anybody in a bad light. Um, I just wanted people at home to know who these artists were as people. And they were some pretty incredible people. They they are, and... One thing I really miss about TNN and we'll say the old CMT are those music news shows where you got to go out yeah. and, and do those things. I, I remember watching, um, I, I believe it was called TNN Tonight or something like that, Country Tonight, something like that, Crook and Chase, all those on there. And I looked forward to seeing those news updates Every night because you got to see yeah. stuff that you never got to see anywhere else. And I, I really miss that side of, of, of the industry. I do too. And there just really aren't that many shows that do that for country music. Um, I enjoy Inside Edition, but that's a little bit of everything. Right. You know? But mm-hmm. it was completely country-centric. Um I miss the old, now this is going back a little further, but I'm. did you ever watch Nashville Now? Yes. I interviewed Ralph. I interviewed Ralph. Uh, what did you think about Ralph? Ago. Oh, hero, hero, because I was friends with Steve Hall for yeah. a good many, many years. years. And, uh, oh, my God. I, I actually, this interview is making me want to call him. I saved his number and say, hey, come talk to the two of us uh, because the thing that you say, you know, you enjoy Inside Edition – uh, not to sidetrack from the point you were about to make, but like the stuff on TNN, it wasn't tabloid, excuse me, but it wasn't tabloid BS. Right. It, it wasn't, no, you, you know, know, this 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 person has a new makeup line or, or this salacious thing happened with a leak on the internet. I mean, times were different, but still now everything is, is spiteful and rumorful and just right. negative. TNN, it was a positive influence on who these people are, what is their music? Come to us, hear what they have to offer, and if you go out, if you like them, go out, see them in concert, buy their music. There was nothing malicious about anything that was done on that network, and that's what I miss the most. No, you're right. We we took family viewing to heart, and we tried to put heart into everything we did. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. um, and there would even be comedians who would come on some of these shows, the Grand Ole Opry. Um, you mentioned Crook and Chase, Nashville Now, and they would even screen the um, comedians' jokes. Family friendly, folks. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And it was a it was a lifestyle. That was I think that was it. It was more of a country music lifestyle that we were portraying, mm-hmm. and it was reality. You know, it's like um, country music's full of so much life, and yet a lot of the music that we're getting out of Nashville now. Um, the, it, it catchy tunes, uh, you know, they're all to me. A lot of it's the same. I love those old story songs when a song really told the story. We've got a few of those out there now, mm-hmm. but I, the, you mm-hmm. know, the songwriting again, everything evolves to the taste of the public, and right. the public likes what they like now. And the audience, I think, is younger than it's ever been before. And I think you have artists like Taylor Swift who have changed that over the years um and so you know and these record companies are going to cater to who's going to put the most money in the register you know the most cha-ching and the kids are buying records but i think some of the you know older folks are too Mm -hmm. it's it's you Mm -hmm. know like i said it's just a different way to do business now and and we're still learning (laughs) since we're older (laughs) we're just catching up we're just now catching up. We're really, you'd be surprised how many of like the T. Graham Browns and um, I, I can't even think of anybody else right now. The Ronnie McDowell, just how they're really um, learning to work that social media and we're learning to work social media and how we're seeing 
again, okay, I see how these kids have manipulated it. Tim did this little video the other day called the Non-Essential Worker Blues. This was shot on a cell phone <laughs> in his living room. It's, it's pretty fun. But it's been seen. It's no promotion, no whatever. And people have found it. And Tim's had over like 107,000 wow. views on the Non-Essential Worker Blues. That's awesome. No. So, you I know, people that. are cool. people are finding you on social media and that's a game changer for everybody. Yeah, cuz everybody can you go live now too and just communicate better yeah. than they ever could before. Yeah, so you don't have to have that major label anymore. It's nice to have that major label, but you don't have to have that major label and Ricky Skaggs was telling me years ago he, when he started Skaggs Family Records that it's nice. He may not sell as many uh, records as he did back when he was on Epic, but a hundred percent of what he makes goes into his pocket. Right. Right. You know, so there's a lot of advantages to doing what you do as an independent now, and just uh, they have independent record charts, and uh, just uh, just a lot more doors are opened, and it's amazing. Um, when, when TNN was going, I mean, we were breaking new people, um, all the time, mm -hmm. but don't you guys think the field was a lot smaller back then? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If you heard about yeah. somebody through TNN or CMT, you knew they were something. And now it's just like that puddle is out there and you just don't know, you know, if they're special or not because everybody's doing it. But if you saw them on one of those networks like that, it was just like, oh, I like them. I'm glad they they shared them. And then they become, you know, sometimes superstars. I'll tell you oh, one wow. of the things I'm most proud of is um, I interviewed Katie Lang in Calgary. Um, oh, wow. She was playing a hotel in Banff, and somebody said, you need to take your cameras and you need to go. I was up there uh, covering the Calgary Stampede. Um, the Judds were going to be playing. And I was going to do an interview with the judge, and I had a night off. And they said, go to this, go to the Bant, the Speak Hotel in Banff. I forget the name of it. It's the biggest one they have. It's incredible. This girl named Katie Lang is performing there. She's a little odd, but boy, <laughs> can she sing. And I can remember that she told me that night in an interview that she was felt like she was the reincarnation of Patsy Klein. that she was Patsy Klein. Wow. <laughs> it was a bizarre <laughs> interview. She's kind of changed that rhetoric. But that was her first <laughs> national interview. I'm not saying I broke Katie Lang, but I'm saying it didn't hurt Katie Lang. Exactly. Somebody would have found her anyway. But, uh, yeah, if you really believed in somebody, you could put them on air. And you're right, TNN had a lot of traction, and so did CMT back then. Well, that's why we do what we do. We talk to people like you, like Tim, but and we talk to new artists. And we also talk to people like Tracy Bird and Tracy Lawrence and you know, p real legends as much as the new artists, because you never know who's going to be who. And right. it's just about telling their story and giving them that platform to talk about their music. And some of them are a little more media trained than others and know how to get that message across. But you can't, if we can be an outlet for that practice and for that, for a new artist or that message for somebody who knows where they stand that's our job, and it sounds like you would agree. It's just to talk to these people and find out what makes them tick and, and what's important to them. Absolutely, and you guys are doing a great job, and we appreciate you very much. Oh, I well, appreciate it. You, you mentioned Tracy Bird. Um, I'm, you probably probably need to go, but Tracy Bird impressed me so much one night. Um, I really? hopped on a bus with Tracy Bird along with probably – four or five other media people uh, to do an interview. We were going to ride the bus with him over to the Midnight Jamboree, and he was going to do a midnight radio show. And before he talked to anybody, he excused himself. He went back to the back of the bus after the Opry. He called and talked to his kids because he knew it was their bedtime, and then he oh, came wow. out for the interview. And that oh. impressed me. His priorities were right. And I, I've always been a Tracy Bird fan ever since that moment. He won me over big time. He, he was super oh. sweet when we talked to him um, uh, probably about a month ago. Yeah.
Good. Let's wrap and talk about Ralph for a minute because Ralph to me is uh, is the quintessential country music host, journalist, interviewer, whatever you want to say about him. He's the Johnny Carson of country music. Could there ever be somebody like that? Uh, maybe it's a Bobby Bones, but a standard bearer for quality to introduce artists on a national scale. Do you think we'll ever see that again? I don't know. I tell you what I don't believe we'll see. I don't believe we'll see anybody like Ralph Emery again who can have a 50, who has 50 years longevity in the business. You know, Mm -hmm. it'd be nice. Bobby Bones is great. Will Bobby Bones still be doing what he's doing in 30, 40 years? I I don't know. I hope so, Mm -hmm. but we don't know. Only time will tell. But, you know, Ralph grew up in that magical era. You know, he was there at the right time and knew everybody. And that midnight show that he had, that night all-nighter, that was great when the artist could just walk in and spend all night with them and enjoy themselves. And and if you go back and listen to some of those old shows, there are a few archives shows you can listen to out there. Um, That's pretty fabulous stuff. And. uh, they, they appreciated him, and he appreciated them. And, and to listen to Ralph on an interview, it's just like listening to a conversation between old friends. It's not so much an interview. It's a conversation. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, there's not that many people doing like that out there. Uh, again, time will tell, because that's a longevity issue. But he was you're right. He was the quintessential country music, air personality slash host. And you are just fabulous as well. This was so much fun. Real quick, last question. What are you doing now? Are you still doing music journalism? Are you now focusing on producing with Tim? What What are you doing right now in this 24, 21st century digital media? What are you doing now? Where has life taken you? Lately, uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, I was in the studio with Jeannie Seeley. Oh, wow. Yeah, I I wrote a children's book. She had an idea called Granta Claus about (laughs) Santa Claus's mother who becomes Mm -hmm. Granta Claus to the world. And it's the cutest book, and we um, cut the audio tracks for that yesterday, and we're going to, you know, build it with a musical bed and some sound effects, and I don't want to say who's going to illustrate, but there's a big illustrator, hopefully, crossing my fingers that that happens. And um, I'm full-time. Tim Atwood is a full-time job for me. <laughs> I'm doing, I, I didn't even know what I didn't know about the business. It surprises me how ignorant I am on a daily basis when you try to do everything um, because uh, I promote Tim. I book him. I go with Tim to all the shows. I turn into the merch girl. I am all <laughs> of that and more. So it's a learning experience. I've never had more fun in my life. Um, we're doing some shows with uh, T. Graham Brown occasionally. Just did one with Jeff Carson uh, talking about the 90s. Um, Tim goes out and plays these jamborees and operas. And last year we traveled thousands of miles. We played Maine and Texas and Arizona and Florida and Ohio. So it, it that's kind of cool because I had never really done that before. I'd fly out and do a story, but this is a whole different thing. One of the coolest things was right before uh, the pandemic hit in February, we took a, a road down on Merle Haggard's bus to Lukenbach, Texas, and wow. did a show in Lukenbach. That was amazing. That was so cool. But, yeah, I'm still writing. Um, I write for a couple of newspapers. Um, I write for a paper in Maine um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, updates on country music. Um, Yeah, I'm out there still writing when I can. I'm about to begin Jeannie Seeley's uh, biography with her. We're going to do it as a joint venture. Cool. Autobiography, biography. And... uh, Life is good. It is full. It is good. We are healthy, so we are blessed. Oh, that and and health health being number one. But Roxanne, you've got yes. to write a book on your your country music journey because it's just so fascinating. I know we could go on for hours, but this was just an absolute pleasure. I have so many memories of being in Nashville and visiting Nashville just based on your stories alone. So the thank you. This was awesome. 
Oh, this looks fun, guys. Thank you so much, and keep doing what you're doing. We need you. Don't go anywhere. We're here as long as we can be. Well, thank you. That means a lot. You know, Matt, I actually have a story that I I didn't bring up to her, but I kind of wanted to bring it up here. I have, for some reason, I've always had this fascination of television and, and TV studios and uh, movie studios, radio stations, and where they are located and what they look like and how they operate. I've just always loved that side of things. And my first time in Nashville was uh, 1998. So it's going to kind of date me a little bit. And I was with my... You were two. <sighs> whatever. I was with my mom, my brother, and one of my aunts. We had taken just a 4th of July trip. And... Um, we drove to Opryland, and I knew CMT and TNN, which we talked a lot about on, on this episode, um, were the Gaylord Entertainment stations. They've both since been bought out by Viacom, and Viacom changed TNN to Spike TV, and God knows what it is at this moment. But, um, you know, they, they lost the country lifestyle channel, and CMT kind of picked up some of that with the reality shows and stuff. But um, th- they were located at Opryland. And at this point, Opryland is a, they're, they're undergoing the construction for the mall that is now, um, Opry Mills. And, uh, so we didn't get to see Opryland, but we went in the hotel and where we drove through, there were the gates to the TV stations and you couldn't get in. My my thing was, I got to get in there. So I was asking around, Hey, do you guys do tours? They're like, no, we don't. So, um, I, I just thought that it was super cool that, you know, they were located outside this hotel and actually WSM AM, which many can get on a clear night around the country, 6.50 AM, was located inside the hotel. I don't know if you knew that. Hmm. Oh, okay. I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you right there and tell a little brief story inside your story. Okay. Okay. When I was eight years old, it was my first time to Nashville. We were there for a conference for my mom for her work. She's in communications, public communications. It was the the Nina conference. Mm-hmm. They were at the they were at the Opry, they were at the Gaylord. And uh, Charlie Daniels was the performer for the uh, for the event for the closing night. Charlie Daniels band because he does a lot of stuff with first responders, etc., yeah. etc. Cetera, et cetera. So inside, now it was probably long out of there by that time, but inside the Opry Land Hotel, and I think it's still there, is a satellite radio station, a satellite radio booth. Mm -hmm. And I got to go in. I don't know if they, I was just a cute kid. I was staring in the window and I got to go on air and and do a quick promo for the Charlie Daniels concert that nobody could could attend. So they, they let me on the air, the disc jockey let me on the air it was really cute and i've i've re- i remember that i remember that trip to uh to nashville very vividly and i don't remember much from that my childhood but yeah yeah that that's where that yeah that that's awesome i i don't think yeah i think it was just their main uh i don't think it was their main studio but i think a lot of them were right were based out of there but um mm-hmm. i i just find that stuff fascinating so when she was talking about like tnn and all that it just brought to mind how um, all that you know that was fresh in my mind of seeing all that and plus we had uh, toured the Grand Ole Opry at that time and primetime country was on I don't know if you remember that uh, and we got to uh, tour the set I'm sure I have pictures somewhere and I have to get a hold of my mom because I know I don't have them of my brother and me sitting at the primetime country desk uh, which was at actually the Grand Ole Opry had it. I don't know if you even knew this. The Grand Ole Opry had, I believe, two TV stations in the back of it. Not stations. Yep. TV studios. Studios. Yeah. And Primetime Country was taped there. Yeah. And they had a crowd uh-huh. and all that. So I, I just, that stuff for some reason still fascinates me. I look that stuff up all the time. And uh, I just thought that was super cool. Um, you know, and kind of just brought back those memories of all that. Um, but I believe WSM has since been relocated to on the property, uh, just not in the hotel since the flood happened a decade ago. I think it kind of wiped them out. And I actually, 
when I lived in Nashville, I worked at uh, the hotel. Uh, I don't know if you knew that. A lot of uh, new stuff. No, you never actually we're told me. Finding out about each other. Yeah, I uh, I don't know if the riverboats are still there, but I was a photographer um, at the riverboats, so um, I would walk past um, the radio station purposefully, actually, just to kind of gawk at it and see who was in there. And sometimes you wouldn't see anybody. But answer me this: I never figured out how the hell did anybody ever get in that radio booth i could never find a door you probably saw the same you probably saw the same booth i did it was right oh, there did. it was right there as far as i remember it was right there he came around or he waved us around a corner it was it was probably around a corner i don't remember i remember being in the booth i just and being in the window yeah and then being in the booth i don't remember but it was t- i was young and it was tiny even to the proportions of size that I, you know, as a tiny kid, I could tell it was a small room. Well, it looked so, like the, it kind of had some depth to it from what I remember. Yeah, so. it was deep, but it wasn't it wasn't wide. Right. Yeah, so that that's kind of fun. But just bringing all this, just talking about all this just brings back so many memories of I got to call there. Ralph. I got to email Ralph <laughs> Emery. In fact, I'm going to do it right now. Hang on. I have his email. Okay. But we, um, you know, just... Talking about all that just brings back all those memories that, um, you know, I I still wish, you know, I'm, I'm kind of old fashioned. I don't like change as far as things like that go. And I, I still wish that stuff was around. I, I miss that lifestyle where I know we have circle, but, um, you know, I remember growing up with TNN and CMT and MTV when it was actually music videos. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I hate the... I hate it. And I, I know hate is a strong word, but, and I have to say where the lifestyle stuff is gone and folks, you spent 35 minutes listening to rocks. And if you want to click away, click away, kind of like Garth says with his encores, if you got to leave, go. But now we're just jamming here because <laughs> I got to say, they, they became reality networks. T, like you said, mm-hmm. TNN became spike TV. Uh, there's now a TNN up in the upper, but they're not, I don't think they're doing anything crazy original. Uh, RFD TV is great, but the lifestyle TV networks became, and RFD is something, now I'm sure they produce their own stuff, but RFD is, I would say, 70 to 90% what they call pay-to-play television, which is you go out, you find the advertisers, sell your show, attach the advertisers to your show, uh, get the money, hand over the product Finished to the network, and they, and they air it. Yeah. So... But where the lifestyle TV shows are right now are the HGTVs, the food networks, mm-hmm. the travel channel. There's not anything really devoted to, I don't want to say Heartland, but to music and to to just that kind of lifestyle. Rural life, even though, because RFD TV is for farmers, no offense. I mean, it's great. It's great rural television, but... It's there's to that suburban just lifestyle that you come home, you want to hear good country music and you don't want the drama. Now it's all drama. Yeah. And it's all reality. We went from talk to reality. And and you got it. You could get me going for hours on this because this is just this is the stuff I read about. I'm reading two books. I'm reading a book on the history of Merv Griffin's show and I'm reading a book on uh, the the creation of the 24 hour news cycle with CNN. And this stuff just fascinates me because it was born out of genuine talk and we went to spiteful reality and pound you over the head 24 hour news. Yeah. So it's all ratings, dude. They, they, yeah. it, that's what it's all. And it's always been about that, but it's it used to be, I think a little more relaxed on those cable networks. And then now it's really, they've spiked it up, so to speak, pun intended, if you will, um, to make it, even more dramatic and it's just not enjoyable. A hundred percent agree. Well, I think we've gone really, really long. We did like <laughs> two and a half episodes in one today. So this yep. was fun. It's just oh, yeah. fun. And you know what? I know you were thinking, do we do this as a wrap or do we do it as another episode? I like when we talk about issues in the front because it kind of sets up, especially when we have somebody like Roxanne kind of what's going on and, and what her perspective is. So this was a fun one. Oh yeah, totally. And I, we, could go on hours with her and I'm sure when we get to meet up with her in Nashville, I, I can just imagine the other stories that yeah. uh, they'll be able to tell us. 
for the Music Universe Podcast. I'm Matt. And I'm Buddy. Thanks for listening. And keep checking out more podcasts uh, wherever podcasts are heard, including YouTube. And check out themusicuniverse.com. <laughs>